Welcome to Democracy Dialogues, a conversation we need to be having now about the state of democracy in the Americas. I'm Eric Farnsworth coming to you from the Council of the Americas offices in Washington, D.C. Democracy in Latin America appears increasingly troubled. Leaving aside dictatorships in Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba, long-standing stable democracies are increasingly coming under pressure. From events in Brazil in early January to the ongoing crisis in Peru, the erosion of press freedoms in Mexico and Colombia to the unfathomable levels of corruption in Guatemala, Honduras, and elsewhere, to say nothing of events in Haiti, and the increasing presence of malevolent outsiders such as Russia and Iran, and the impact on democratic practice of China's increasing engagement, democracy may be more troubled now than at any time during the 1980s. That's a big statement and we need to unpack it. Are things really so bleak? Where do we stand and where do we go from here? Our guest today is Brian Winter, the editor-in-chief of America's Quarterly Magazine and a colleague of mine here at the Council of the Americas. Brian worked as a journalist across Latin America for many years prior to joining the Council in 2015 and has written and spoken extensively, particularly on Brazil. Follow him on Twitter at Brazil Brian. Brian Winter, welcome to Democracy Dialogues. Thank you, Eric, for the invitation. The events of January 8th in Brazil were a shock to many, not to you. Tell us why and how we got to where we are. Oh, that's a big question. Thank you for having me on this series, which I, I think is a very important contribution to this bigger story of democratic backsliding that we see in a lot of the world, not just in Latin America. I think what happened in Brazil on January 8th was part of a bigger picture of democracy in Latin America. It's, uh, if you look at the long term, I think there are some positive things to say. The year that, I'm 44 years old, uh, the year that I was born. A in youngster. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, the year that I was born in 1977 was actually the low point for democracy in Latin America, which I think was probably a coincidence. Um, <laughs> there were only three democracies in Latin America, pure democracies at the time. Uh, they were Costa Rica, Colombia, and ironically, Venezuela. Yep. Um, and over the course of the next 13 years, really, we saw this massive democratizing wave sweep across the region that was unlike anything, really, that we saw anywhere else in the world. And, and sitting here today, 85% of Latin America's population lives under democracy. And that is, compared to virtually any other region in the world, it's a high percentage. Yes, some of those democracies uh, are under pressure. Some are clearly in retreat. But overall, even in some of these countries that you mentioned, the system is holding and there's no dictator that has yet kind of stepped in to take it the rest of the way home like there has in, in Venezuela, um, Cuba, and Nicaragua, uh, as you mentioned. Those are still the exceptions. So, you know, as part of that story of kind of democracy growing and now being under pressure again, Brazil clearly fits in. And uh, it's true that I, believe, many people believe that <clears throat> what happened on January 8th was, was to be expected. I, th I think I got the timing wrong. I expected something like that mm -hmm. to happen before the election instead of after. The fact that it happened one week after Lula had already taken office is testimony to, I think, you know, really one of the things that's driving this phenomenon, which is information bubbles and particularly social media. Because again, any reasonable person would say, especially if you compared it with what happened here on January 6, 2021, which of course was during the transition before President Biden was able to take office, you're like, why did they, what were they thinking? What did they, why did they do this? And um, the answer is bewildering, but simple, which is the protesters believed, and there were only about 5,000 of them, but you know, in world history, 5,000 people can do a lot of damage. Um, these people believed that if they, invaded the government buildings there in Brasilia and caused enough trouble that the armed forces would have no choice but to come out on the streets and intervene. And then they believed that the military would take the protesters' side uh, and that that would lead to Lula being removed from office and Bolsonaro being restored to, quote unquote, his rightful place. 
There were no odds of this happening. This was never going to happen. Just as I don't think you know, we were ever within one or two steps of democracy falling apart here in the United States. But there are a lot of bad things that can happen in a country like Brazil that fall short of a coup um, actually being realized. And I think that's the challenge Brazil faces now, is how do you get out of this situation where you, know, you did have this tremendously damaging, very symbolically charged event on January 8th? How do you deal with some of these questions that it's raised, like the loyalties of the armed mm -hmm. forces? How do you govern a country that, where the democracy is under pressure and where things are so polarized after the 51-49 election that we saw last year? I mean, you raised some really important points. Let's probe a couple of those if we can. One is, uh, you know, okay, it was loud, it was symbolic, it was ugly, there was vandalism and destruction, but perhaps democracy itself wasn't at risk. Give us a sense of why you say that in terms of what are some of those guardrails. And I'm asking because that's relevant for other countries as well. Yeah. Well, I think that there was a really encouraging reaction by Brazilian institutions before and after January 8th. I said that I expected something like this to happen prior to the inauguration. I believe that ex-president Bolsonaro, if he had had the ability to do so, would have either um, canceled, postponed, or tried to overturn the election result. This is, I mean, to me, as someone who follows Brazil on a day-to-day -day basis, this was so abundantly clear that it's, it, it's almost not worth re-explaining kind of why that happened. But let's just say one data point. Bolsonaro invited the entire diplomatic corps in Brasilia into the presidential palace in, I think it was June of 2022, and gave a 45-minute PowerPoint presentation where he talked about um, how unreliable the electronic voting system was. This in conjunction with a series of other statements that he made, including that he could only lose if there was fraud, made very clear his uh, intent. But Starting um, really in 2021, but certainly through that election campaign of last year, Brazil's other institutions recognized that risk. And so, for example, you had important members of the business community in 2022 sign a letter saying that Brazil's democracy needed to be respected. You had um, on the day of the election. In fact, not just the day of the election, but within 45 minutes of the result being made final and Lula becoming the president-elect of Brazil, you had the um, head of Congress, who was a Bolsonaro ally, yep. who had campaigned for Bolsonaro during the campaign, come out and say that the people's will needed to be respected and that the result was essentially final. And that, so that closed the door for um, Bolsonaro to try to overturn the election. So I, I, because of these various shows of support that also came from other Brazilian institutions, again, I don't think democracy itself was ever in danger. But we shouldn't now look back and say, oh, it was never gonna happen. No, no, no. The lesson for other countries maybe is that this didn't happen in the end because all of these various constituent groups in Brazilian society stood up and said, no, whoever wins the election, is going to be the next president of Brazil. And that's unfortunately on a long list of things that in many countries we can no longer take for granted. I mean, you're pointing to, it, really interesting, it, you know, individuals matter in a circumstance yeah. like this. Individuals who stand up and say, not on my watch, this isn't gonna happen. I'm reminded of what happened in Mexico in the year 2000 with President Zedillo uh, and the opportunity to change the electoral calculus so that Fox was not uh, brought into the, you know, other countries have faced this, but is this, we can't answer this question, but is this a story of individuals or systems or both? I think it's both. I mean, yeah. I think that particularly Artur Lira, who was the head of Congress who did this, I think will go down as an important figure. Um, also the role of the Supreme Court, uh, although that, that story is a little more uh, complex. Mm. I think also the fact that there were two things that Brazil had, quote unquote, working in its favor. One is it is a country that had a recent experience with military dictatorship that a lot of people who are in power today remember. It was a negative experience. They only came back to democracy in 1985. And so that muscle memory, that, that people actually remembering that, that that happened. And you know to talk about the risk of losing democracy, or in the, democracy here in the United States where we, it's always been the case, 
um, people can take that for granted in a way that Brazilians uh, don't. And then I would also say the fact that we had a January 6th yeah. here in the United States made Brazilians very aware, very aware of the risks. And while it's true that they had their January 8th, uh, and, and that was, you know, got the attention of the world and, and has led to all kinds of crisis of democracy and people asking fundamental questions about how safe these institutions are, I would say that the fact that it didn't happen earlier was partly a result of people looking at what happened in the United States on January 6, 2021 and saying, mm, we have to do everything within our power to make sure, for example, that the election is not questioned in a lasting way. Yeah, yeah, the, the whole integrity of the system. What does it mean for the very young Lula government uh, coming in a week after the inauguration facing this, but you know, looking ahead, how does this change or does it change the calculus in terms of which the Lula government now is, is governing. Yeah, you know, the Lula government's got a hell of a problem yeah, on its hands yeah. because the biggest difference between the United States and Brazil and these events that we you know keep comparing that were two years and two days apart <laughs> is that uh, in the case of Brazil, the loyalties of the military and the other security forces, the police mainly, are very much in question. Mm -hmm. That was never really the case here in the United States. Okay, yes, there were police and people in the rank and file who, who were very sympathetic to Trump. Well, that's not the same thing as, of course, as openly supporting a movement that would eject a democratically elected president. The senior commanders of the armed forces, for the most part, uh, in Brazil seem to value democracy and the Constitution of 1988. But once you get below that first level of yeah. officials, things get very complicated. And we've seen evidence emerge over the last couple of weeks since this all happened that uh, the, the military as a whole was not complicit, but individual actors, it appears that they were. I mean, in some cases, literally opening the doors to the presidential palace and letting people in. And in other cases, um, again, uh, evidence suggests that the military was did not want to uh, clear out these camps of people who were outside military barracks throughout the country, openly demanding military intervention in politics to, to stop Lula. So if you're Lula, how do you deal with that? <clears throat> I'm relatively optimistic about his ability to do so, in part because you said that this all mentioned, or you mentioned that this all happened within a week of his taking yeah, office. Yeah. Well. Lula's been there before, yes. <laughs> for better and for worse. <laughs> and uh, he knows, in a case like this, he knows where the levers of power are. And he is, even his opponents concede, that he's the most skilled Brazilian politician of his generation. And uh, he, I think, has done a good job projecting a certain amount of calm, of transmitting power, and making clear that Brazil's institutions will identify and prosecute the people who are involved in this without making it into too much of a witch hunt yeah. or something that could really be more divisive than it needs to be. We'll see how that goes. It's still early days. Um, and it's also true that it's not just up to him. I mentioned that the Supreme Court is a complex mm -hmm. actor in this, and there's one Supreme Court judge in particular, Alexandre G. Moraes, who has gotten a lot of attention, including here in the press in the United States. In the last week, both the New York Times and Washington Post have done big profiles on the things that this guy is doing, uh, among them um, suppressing political speech in Brazil in the name of protecting democracy. Um, I'm concerned about that because that's a, you know, that's a fundamental part of democracy yeah. is, is not absolute freedom, and we don't have absolute freedom of speech here in the United States, but I, you know, I'm always hesitant to, I, I believe that countries should generally try to suppress political speech as little as possible, because you risk radicalizing yeah. people even further and creating the impression that there's no place for them at the table. So we'll see where that goes. I think that's a clear risk area, because you know, the risk is that you end up with a country uh, that is not only polarized, but ungovernable mm. over the next four years. I think that's the risk mm. for Lula and for Brazil. Not that there could be a coup, whether popular or military or otherwise. I think the risk is that uh, the things could get out of hand and he might not have command and control of the security forces, that you might see mass protests and acts of civil disobedience and so on. That would be bad for a country that you know, where people are still 10% poorer than they were 10 years ago mm. and that really needs to kind of 
take a deep breath and, and go forward. Yeah, that whole uh, conversation about uh, freedom of political speech and the internet age and social media, and I mean, that is a huge conversation that we're all facing in terms of Western democracy. And it's so complicated. Yeah. And I don't think anyone has like a clear yeah. Uh, playbook on the absolute best way to handle it. We're still in the early days. Yeah, but as you say, it's absolutely something that's contributing to questions about democratic resilience, and we need to get a handle on where some of these things are going. Yeah, I mean, the argument that a lot of people, especially on the left, make in Brazil is that um, is that because of the country's history of coups and military dictatorships, that uh, speech supporting a coup should not be permitted. And I, I, I understand, and, and look, I mean, the First Amendment in the United States uh, is an exception in the global landscape, but it's not a bug in the system. It's not an anachronism in the way that some people in other countries treat it. I personally believe, and look, I mean, here I'm, I'm biased perhaps because I'm not only an American, but I, most of my career was spent as a journalist. So of course I believe in the First Amendment. Um, but I, I happen to believe that that ability to express a view that even I might find abhorrent does ultimately strengthen democracy. Yeah. And that part of the reason that our democracy here in the United States is as long lasting as it is, even with all its imperfections, and especially in recent years, is because we have generally been hesitant to restrict people's political speech. And so every time I see this, things like this happening, especially in a country like Brazil, it, it makes me nervous, even if I would admit that I, I don't have all the answers. Yeah. No, that's, uh, as I say, I hope you'll come back and discuss these uh, issues in greater length based on your own background and, and keen understanding. We're here at the uh, Democracy Dialogues with Brian Winter, who's the editor-in-chief of America's Quarterly Magazine. Follow him at Brazil Brian on Twitter. Brian, you already have, I think, 8 million followers on Twitter, uh, something you're only, like that. You're so. only encouraging my Twitter addiction by, <laughs> well, you know, pushing this further. You know, <laughs> keep putting good stuff out there, you'll keep getting followers. Supply and demand, good stuff. Well, let's uh, open the aperture a little bit. Uh, the rest of the region, there are some troubling uh, developments, particularly right now in Peru. I wonder if you see a path forward in terms of what's happening in Peru, and uh, Peru's a strong democracy, but it also has some challenges uh, that we've seen. Uh, give us a sense of how you see the issues. Yeah, Peru's tough. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's one of the more complex situations mm. I think we've seen in the region these last couple of years, in part because it, it has all the ingredients that have led to this wave of protest movements that we've seen really since Chile in 2019, and then in Ecuador, in Colombia, uh, in Bolivia, and, and now uh, in Peru. I mean, some of these elements are as old as time. Yeah. In Peru, it's the rural-urban divide. Uh, it's also, you know, the gap between rich and poor, which is the perennial, I think, the root cause of so much of what uh, mm -hmm. drives unrest and instability in Latin America, not just in the last six years, but for the last 300? 600. Maybe. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> right. um, so that's a problem. But look, uh, Peru has some additional complicating elements, which is this uh, political system that gives Congress and p pretty much puts Congress and the presidency at loggerheads unless they're controlled by the same party. And where Congress's ability to remove a president is always present, even for this, again, this, this clause of moral incapacity, which has now been invoked multiple times over the last couple of years. And that's why I've kind of lost count. I think it's six presidents in the last six years in Peru, if I'm not mistaken. So trying to find a way out of this impasse that they're in right now is is difficult. You see these protests happening and it pains me in a way because you know Peru was a success story for so long. Absolutely. It was a country yeah. that did manage to establish some kind of democratic equilibrium for a long time coming out of the authoritarian years of the 90s under, you know, Alberto Fujimori. Um, and it also saw massive strides in poverty reduction. Only Chile was comparable in that period between about uh, the early 90s to the mid-2010s. Uh, it was not a perfect story. Um, informality remained very high. That's one of the reasons Peru, according to some measures, including the Johns Hopkins database, was the country in the world hardest hit yeah. on a per capita mm -hmm. basis by COVID. So that tells you that there were a lot of people on the outside looking in on this increased poverty. There's no doubt about that. But now you look at a situation like the one we're seeing where you have another government where, you know, a lot of people question its legitimacy. Uh, you have a protest movement with a lot of legitimate re grievances plus some elements that are 
I think anarchists sure. uh, are just there to cause trouble. Mm -hmm. um, agitators. Agitators. Yeah. I, I, it's a really complex situation. Yeah. You know, it's been interesting, though, to me to see two events happening, not simultaneously, but closely, uh, you know, in, in real time in January, Brazil, Peru. You've had a totally different response from the international community in mm -hmm. each circumstance. And I wonder, is there a double standard somehow in democracy in the Western Hemisphere? I mean, do certain countries get a pass for doing some things and other countries don't? I mean, these are issues I've struggled with for a long sure. time, particularly in the context of U.S. policy. But how do you see that? Because, you know, just as you've said it, Peru is, is complicated. Yeah. And it's not black and white necessarily, at least in the way some people are portraying it. How, how, do we, how should we be thinking about some of those issues? You're referring to the fact that global public opinion was generally against the protesters yeah. in Brazil and in favor of yeah. the protesters yeah. in Peru? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I think there's always a tendency to kind of treat these stories as black and white, mm -hmm. and it falls into the polarization of left and right that, that always happens. But I, I do think they're different. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the case of Brazil, we're talking about a group of people who went in and vandalized and mm -hmm. burned and did other things to the three symbols, the three seats of you know, the executive, judicial, and legislative branch to try to trigger a, a coup, like we said. Um, and that has shadows of what happens here, or happened here in the United States. And so I think everybody understood what the risk was there. It was not people, you know, looking for, uh, to bring an election forward or to uh, looking for social rights. This was, this was golpismo, right? I mean, this was 100% pure, like, let's topple a legitimately elected government. In the case of Peru, like I said, I think it's a mix. I, I do think uh, it's very clear that a lot of people are there who are disenfranchised, who are upset, particularly about the living conditions in Peru's south, where you know malnutrition levels, access to health care, kind of other problems. I mean, they're not new, but they haven't been resolved in the same with the same rate of progress as they have in places like Lima. And so there's legitimate grievance there. And then, yes, there are, according to you know, reports that I've seen, uh, there are elements that are just there um, to you know, try to topple a government that I, I suppose could be similar in some ways to what we saw mm -hmm. in Brazil. But um, you know, the right to protest is uh, an important part of democracy. The other element, of course, that has generated so much revulsion uh, amongst other neighboring Latin American countries, and also in the United States and Europe, is the reaction of the Peruvian security mm -hmm. forces. Mm -hmm. And here, you know, I see some parallels with what happened in Chile in 2019, where it is what often turns public opinion against these governments is when the military and the police are out there shooting people down in cold blood, as we've seen in multiple cases in Peru. If I was president of one of these countries, I would be out there standing in front mm -hmm. of the military saying, for the love of God, don't do this, because it is the quickest way not only to bring more of your own people out onto the streets, because they know, you know they, they're disgusted by what your police and, and military are doing, but also to turn global public opinion against you, and I think that's what we've seen happening with Peru. Yeah, yeah, and uh, those, uh, how do you say, news clips <coughs> of some of these um, you know, actions in Peru have gone viral. Well, and, and it's also true that we've, I mean, with the news clips, there have been, uh, policemen have been killed. Yeah. Uh, in one case, I think a body was set on fire. I mean, these are not, these are not simple stories. Yeah. Well, I guess that, that was the basis of the question because I think with Brazil, it's pretty cut and dried. I think it is, you know, just as you described it and the international community can see that and it's pretty clear. Yeah. In the Peruvian situation, I mean, you did have a constitutional process which removed an incompetent president who tried to self coup and and you know so you go to the Salac meeting in Argentina and you have half of Latin America it seems uh, you know uh, publicly supporting a restoration of the guy who tried to do exactly what Fujimori did and not not exactly almost exactly in, almost in exactly yeah. yeah so and I guess my question is and 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 it's you know, the two are not obviously comparable in many ways, but why that rush to support somebody who did clearly a bad thing constitutionally in Peru that you might not have had in other countries? Maybe there's no answer to that, but it just seems to me a, an issue that we have to raise. Tribalism. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> uh, the same thing that drives so much behavior yeah. on, on uh, social media yeah. as well. I think people see 
uh, leaders see, populations see someone who's on their team or they perceive as being aligned with them, and it, it puts things through a different prism. I, I come back to you know, the statement at this summit that uh, La Cache Po, the mm -hmm. Uruguayan mm -hmm. president, mm -hmm. made, where he said, look, we can't have different standards for people because we might share ideology with them. That's something that Gabriel Boric has been consistent mm -hmm. over his year in office about saying, too, is he says we have to call out the abuses um, by Venezuela and Nicaragua. We can't close our eyes to these things just because they're on the left. I found it interesting, by the way, that his comments at the summit were actually more critical of the Boluarte government, yes. in part because yes. he's focusing on this same issue of mm -hmm. police and military violence. Mm. And so I, I, you know, I think that's consistent of mm. Boric to do so. But look, I mean, at the end of the day, we all know that there's this tendency that leaders often have to treat someone differently or more favorably because they perceive themselves as being on the same team and that these high-minded ideas of non-intervention, oh, I'm not going to talk about Venezuela because that's not what we do, <laughs> and then those same leaders turn around and criticize the Boluarte government yeah. because yeah. they sympathize with Castillo, who, who, who's on the left. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's fair. Well, we don't have a lot of time remaining, but I want to get your views in terms of some of the lessons uh, for the rest of the region. I mean, look, we, you pointed at the very beginning of our conversation to some very positive things, which I think is absolutely right and sometimes gets overlooked, right? I mean, there is, you know, it's a fundamental difference where we are today from where we are a generation ago. Uh, but there are some worrying challenges and uh, countries are dealing with them differently. But I wonder from where we sit in early 2023, hmm. What can we say about democracy in the region and what can governments be doing to strengthen the democratic processes so that we don't have a January 6th or a January 8th that, uh, you know, again? Well, I think it's important to look at democracy, but I also think it's important to look at economies because yeah, to me, that's actually one of, if not the driving cause of what's happening. In Latin America, most economies are not growing and they have not really grown since 2013. Mm -hmm. In fact, by some measures, the region's citizens are poorer now than they were a decade ago on average. Of course, there are 24 countries in the region. There's a lot of diversity in that. But if you take the aggregate, according to World Bank data, it's stagnant. Uh, living standards are not improving. Uh, people are frustrated. Poverty is no longer coming down. And if you listen to protesters in places like Peru, that's the core of the grievance. And in a lot of cases, they will say, there was a period in their lives when things were getting better, which was the 2000s. My concern is that, you know, here we are, it's 2023, and talking about the good times of the 2000s <laughs> feels more and more distant. It's like sitting on your front porch reminiscing about the good old days the way they used to be. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's not only sad, but it, it's destabilizing. Mm. And uh, that's what I think a lot of these countries have in common. So until we can start getting economies going again um, with policies that are better for investment, with uh, social policies addressing things like, uh, like hunger and malnutrition, mm -hmm. uh, with more trade, you know, all the things that we know make economies grow and that make societies prosper, I feel like we're just going to be stuck in this pattern where people are unhappy with their politicians. It's 15 elections in a row now in Latin America, going back to 2018, where incumbent candidates or their preferred candidate mm -hmm, mm -hmm. have lost in free and fair elections. Mm -hmm. 15. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that, that to me tells a story of, of just general social unrest. I think the lack of economic growth is at the core of that. My concern is that, you know, if you look at governments around the region, there's just not that much focus on that yet. I, I feel like until we get our heads around that problem, we're going to continue to see more of this instability. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a compelling picture that you're painting. And, you know, if you don't have a citizenry that is willing to fight for the system and is willing to take risks because their own circumstances aren't improving, I think is what you've been laying out, you know, that's a, that's a real risk to the system, though. Yeah, it's not that people are like consumed by right. this irrational Correct. delirium Correct. Yep. that things are wrong in their yep. country, so let's get our pitchforks and our torches and go mm -hmm. burn down the presidential palace. <laughs> it's, it's, these are, lives have stopped improving. Yeah. And if your economy is not growing, then you're really only left with trying to redistribute what you've got in a different way, and that's destabilizing too. 
I think growth, and growth sometimes gets a bad name in the 2020s. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Here in the United States, too. Uh, but without it, things like poverty reduction and the big leap forward in living conditions that we all thought was possible, that we saw happen in the 20s, in the 2000s and the early 2010s, it's just not, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen without growth. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, uh, and you look at what are some of the drivers of growth across the region, and you just don't see them in the same way that there were at the beginning of the century, perhaps. One of the things that it, it uh, occurs to me in terms of key data points that are reflective are the summits of the Americas that the United States hosted, the first in 1994, the second in, last year in Los Angeles in 2022. And the number of non-democratic countries uh, in Miami in 1994 was one, it was Cuba. Uh, this time, the next time the United States hosted in 2022, there were three mm -hmm. that were clearly non-democratic and you could make the case for some others I suppose as well. The point being is that we are losing ground over a generation and you know we want to make sure that somehow that doesn't continue, that that trend is halted and reversed and that democracies are strengthened. And I think your point about growth economic distribution of wealth is, you know, that you have to grow first mm -hmm. before you have something to distribute. I think that's a, a really key point and taking advantage of uh, citizens' aspirations to try to meet those aspirations. Yeah. Because otherwise, you know, you're not delivering what people need and they'll seek something else, no? Yeah, and it's a global trend. A I mean, trend, I, Stephen absolutely. Levitsky and others have pointed yeah. to 2007, 2008 as kind of the high water mark for democracies all over the world. Yeah. It was the Great Recession, and since then we've seen, you know, again, the economic ripples of that uh, and, and support for democracy eroding, magnified also by things like social media, yeah. which I think is a, a big part of the story as well as we, we talked about with Brazil. But look, I mean, I think that uh, you can also get carried away. I sometimes get carried away by the pessimism. Mm -hmm and have to catch myself and remember that Latin America has always been cyclical. There's always been ups and downs. During the good moments, we convince ourselves that things are gonna be great forever. <laughs> During the down moments, uh, sometimes we, we commit the same mistake. This down moment has lasted a while, which makes me worried that you know maybe it's not like faded that we're necessarily gonna go back up. But if you were to make a semi-optimistic case, I think you'd point to the possibilities for nearshoring that so many countries offer uh, in this moment of global change that we're seeing right now, the food and energy supplies, clean energy supplies that many countries mm -hmm. have. And so yep. my yep. hope is that when we do this next time, things will look a little bit better. Well, I hope we do do it again uh, before too long. Our time has expired, unfortunately, now. But I want to thank you for joining us here at Democracy Dialogues. We've talked about some big issues. We've only scratched the surface, I'm afraid, and there is ample uh, material to work with for future conversations, and I do hope that you'll come back. I will come uh, back. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this will conclude our session of Democracy Dialogues uh, from Washington, D.C. Uh, this is Eric Farnsworth, and we hope to see you again very, very soon. Have a terrific day.